everyone, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Casual Obsession, the horror movie podcast where we talk about horror movies. This is the first bonus episode that features all four of the normal hosts, being me, Emma, also known as Emma Panada, um, joined today by my fellow co-stars, uh, me, Noah, also known as Bob. <laughs> Beautiful. Nice. Flawless. Beautiful. Uh, me, Nina, also known as Nina Wolverina. Iconic. And me, oh, yeah. Jeff, also known as the guy who wasn't in that episode a couple weeks ago. What the hell was up with that? Glorious. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, too. We hate that guy. Fuck him. Yeah. In this, who needs in this bonus episode, we're going to be talking me. about the new Netflix show, Midnight Mass. Um, at the time of recording, this show came out a few weeks ago great show uh i think we all really enjoyed it um i think so with this bonus episode we're going to be kind of starting from the get-go with spoilers um this is just going to be kind of a spoiler discussion episode um but we will hit you with some trigger warnings right out the gate so that if this is a show that you're kind of interested in seeing but you're not sure how you'll react to it uh, we'll just give you a warning about the sort of stuff that kind of is in this show. And if you think you'll be okay, then I definitely recommend you give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but definitely. But trigger warnings. Um, I think one, animal death. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, big one. Yeah, there's quite a bit of animal death. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of blood. Lots um, of blood. A tremendous amount of blood. <laughs> yeah. Some self-harm stuff. Mm -hmm. oh yeah um religious trauma it's <laughs> a big, big one, one. <laughs> big lots one. of religious trauma especially if you come from like a conservative religious background yeah um i think this will kind of hit you in a lot of big ways especially if you come from kind of like a catholic or a christian um like background if you've ever been to a church of 60 people this Oof. one's gonna hit yeah. Um, That's gonna my wife grew up in a tiny yeah. Presbyterian church and she had to watch one of the episodes in two separate sittings because it was making her physically sick because it was too familiar. Yeah. Yeah. It's really rough. It can be um, real rough. What was I going to say? Um, other triggers? Oh, um, um, there is a suicide. Yeah, there True. there is a suicide. Yeah. I think my big one that uh, I think a lot of people forget that this can be a trigger there's a lot of discussion of death and a lot of discussion of that kind of existential like level of crisis that I think could be very troubling if you have anxiety mm -hmm. around that. Oh, There's yeah. a solid 15 minute conversation about well, what do you think happens when we die? Yeah. yeah. And, and it gets very, it gets very tough. It comes back um, several episodes later to kind of revisit the same topics after a bunch of stuff has happened. Mm -hmm. Like it's very good. Um, but I would be forewarned going into that. And then uh, miscarriages is one. Yeah. If you have issues oh, yeah. with pregnancy and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a really rough one. Um, I think that was that's it for me personally. That's what I would add. Yeah. Those are both two very good additions. I think that's all I can think of. Uh, I would um, also toss alcoholism on oh, that. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, say yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, this is not a spoiler because it's literally the opening scene of the show, but there is a drunk driving accident at the very, very front of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the Multiple it is alcoholic a core element of the uh, show as it goes on. Yeah. Is the uh, that character's uh, recovery process. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Good one. Good one. Jeff, what's your contribution to the triggers? Um, shit, I didn't I wasn't I didn't know this was going to be on the test. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I You're think good. I think we covered it. I think we got it. I think that's all of them. Oh, some, racism, one, some racism. Uh, like some racism. Kind of racism. Yeah. 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 Some Islamoph yeah. Islamophobia, Islamophobia specifically yeah. Yeah. is yeah. really gotten into. Yeah, yeah that's definitely. in there for sure. But at the same um, time, not in a way. There's some sorry, great, you go. um, like Muslim representation. In the yeah, show. he's a good dude. 
Yeah. Like, this is not the kind of racism that we trigger warn in our 80s movies where it's like, oh, my God, this racism is unconfronted and even done by characters we're supposed to like. Yeah. This is this is a criticism of that racism and that uh, xenophobia within the church. So <laughs> I'm, re- I'm feeling really stupid right now because uh, you didn't realize that was the same person. I didn't. OK, so Raul Coley is the one who plays the sheriff in this. He's a good boy. Uh, but he also, in Bly Manor, played Owen. You didn't and know? I you didn't did realize that? The, you, it's the mustache. I even oh criticized him for The mustache doesn't point, cover up that much, Noah. At one point, I haven't even seen Bly character. Manor, and I know about this now. The must. I would. <laughs> at one point, another character is like calling him, and he asks if they need company. And I was like, "Oh, there's that British accent coming out." And you didn't wonder why I was I commenting on that. I didn't get why you would have said that. I'm like, "Oh, maybe the actor's British." Oh my god. Maybe he is. <laughs> he is. <laughs> and the first character he played in a Mike Flanagan property was also British. Yeah. Okay, he does look well, different, but he also looks exactly the same. So yeah. I don't know, like... I think this is our longest trigger warning segment that we've ever It done. definitely is. Absolutely. It Despite does have, that, it this, is seven this hours thing is of worth content. watching. It is so good. <laughs> it is so good, and I would... Yeah, I would say um, this... Yeah. I, I mean, personally, I had a lot of the triggers that are in this show. I watched it in spite of those. Um, I think... I think it's very worth watching. Um, oh, do we want to you know, all give it a rating? Just like before we dive into spoilers. Yeah. Okay. I can go first. If Sorry, I was yeah. looking at this you, picture you that go, Noah sent to the first, chat Nina. as though it, as though up, it made okay. him right. This is the I'm same man, no. Noah. <laughs> it's obvious. So He's got the know same hair. Like. He's wearing he the same this, kind okay, of so jacket. He's dressed the same, the, Noah. Look at him. <laughs> okay, shut up. Firstly, you know I'm incredibly face blind. I do know that. <laughs> also, forgive me for not, for as a face blind person, being like, oh yeah, the dark skinned guy, clearly the same actor. I'm trying. I'm trying to get okay, you to understand okay. where I'm coming from. I, I yeah. see that. Like, okay. I see that. It's just that he's dressed exactly the that. same. Literally, the only like, difference not, is the mustache. He is not through the entire no, show. Through, okay. Through. This is a rare instance of yeah. him in a jacket. No. You anyway, chose the worst picture possible picture of him. Uh, okay. <laughs> you bullied me, and I'm going to give my rating now. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So here's my here's my thought, and I'm I'm currently rewatching Hill House, so I might change my mind by the time I finish Hill House. But as of right now. Um, I think Midnight Mass is my least favorite of the three Mike Flanagan Netflix shows. Really? Oh, however, interesting. however, How good must however, those other two be? They're that's, really well, that's, good. No, but that's Jeff. my point. Is if we're if we're ranking them, that means like ten, nine, eight, not ten, five, zero. You know, like oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved this show a lot, but I, and I don't want to make my three favorite TV shows fight. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But yeah. There, are, there are just a few moments in this season that dragged a tiny bit for me. I had a lot of issues with Riley and what's her name? Aaron. Aaron. Really? I did not enjoy when they were on screen together. I enjoyed them both separately. Oh. Yeah, I like them. I agree. I like them but, very much as their own people, but yeah. their relationship did not capture me the same way that other like really? Mike Flanagan romantic relationships oh. have done. I really liked it, them. It didn't quite... Yeah, it didn't. We can talk about that me. after later. Yeah. But yeah, so as such, um, very, very worth watching. I would I don't know how to give a numeric value to a whole show, so I'm just going to say two thumbs up. <laughs> OK, <laughs> yeah, okay. that's that's kind of where I'm at, too. All Mike Flanagan TV shows that I have seen, all three of them are 10 on my media scale. They are all like top tier exactly what i'm looking for in horror media like i could not ask for a better example of like the perfect horror thing um i and and as of that i can't even rank them against each other because unlike noah i think they all hit really hard for me in ways that like each of the other ones don't they all have things i don't necessarily like there's one episode of bly manor that just kind of um, brings it down just a little bit, even though the rest of it is perfect. Um, there's one character in Hill House, and there's like one relationship in in Midnight Mass that just like there yeah. everything else is so good. It does all three of those things don't even bear mentioning. 
Uh, so 10 out of 10. All three of them are 10 out of 10. Love them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Je- Jeff, what do you think? I can I literally cannot think of a single thing about this show that I would want to change. I I'm giving Midnight Mass a 10 with no asterisks whatsoever. Nice. I think nice. everything yeah. that it does, like e- even if there's a thing here and there that I like, you know, didn't enjoy, then it's it's still like it serves the greater purpose of all the themes and allegories of the show. So like I I really don't think any of it should be different necessarily. Yes. And I too am giving it a 10 out of 10. Um, I'm on the opposite scale of Noah. I think this is my favorite Mike Flanagan show. Uh, I think that's so reasonable. Far. Um, I would rank them, and it's very, very close, um, but I would rank them Midnight Mass, Bly Manor, Hill House. Um, that's valid. I think I'm Bly, I think, Hill House, Midnight. I think Hill House, the first three episodes drag a little bit. Um, I fully agree. Then the fourth episode where it starts following um, the brother is really good. And then five and six are fucking masterpieces. But Mm -hmm. that's another conversation entirely. Um, But I just I really love this show and I think it's incredible. And also I bugged all of you to watch it. And now we're doing an episode about it. So I am considering this a we all gave (laughs) it a 10 out of 10. I did it. Yeah, <laughs> I, did it, I can't even argue. Yeah, that works. There That's... is no room for argument here. No, I I can't disagree. Yeah. I could sit here and be like, mm, Emma. Well, well, actually, technically, um, technically, Emma, technically, I gave it two thumbs up and not a ten. <laughs> But that's the, the maximum thing. number of thumbs that you have. Two out of that's two true. is equal to ten out of Holy ten. Holy shit, you're that's right. True. I didn't even Math. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Math. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's get into the spoilery discussion. Okay. Because so, I'm hopping to talk yes, about this. Absolutely. So, um, again, we are jumping right into spoiler discussion. Uh, if you haven't watched this show and you were thinking about it and you want to check it out, do it. Definitely don't stay after we start talking because yeah. to be spoiled on this show, I think is a great disservice. Um, yes. I think going in blind is just an incredible experience. Um, so definitely do that. But now uh, let's start off. Uh, I'll go ahead and just kind of do like a quick rundown of an overarching um, like plot synopsis. It's not going to be too detailed because obviously you can get into a lot of, um conversations about like the various things happening in the show but we're just gonna do a broad overview so the movie starts with uh riley flynn who was the son of uh two kind of fisher people on the island uh coming back home after a stint in prison from having killed somebody in a drunk driving accident um at the same time their old um pastor basically their old priest is supposed to come back from a trip to jerusalem as well um however he's a no-show um this worries some people it's whatever um as riley gets back he notices an old friend of his aaron is also back um who's his kind of like childhood sweetheart a little bit and uh, they also have a new sheriff who is uh, muslim And so that creates some tension on the island as well. But going through the show, um, eventually a new priest shows up on the island that um, nobody really knows about. He says that he was sent by the diaspora to cover for their um, priest while he's on the main island or on the mainland in a hospital being Um, taken care of. Just real quick. Diocese, not diaspora. Oh, a diaspora is a scattering of something, not a okay, not a hierarchical did, structure. Uh, yeah. I, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate Sorry. it. No, nope, you're good. I appreciate it. Both my um, parents grew up Catholic, so I know the words. Yeah, I don't know what they all mean though. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this priest that's kind of like a stand-in um, is named. Father Paul. Paul. Father Paul. Father Paul Hill. And uh, um, of Hill House fame. Of Hill House fame. <laughs> oh. Not really. He wasn't in Hill House. 
Oh, but <laughs> he um, sorry, Jeff. This very kind of like personable, very kind guy um, instantly connects with the people of the island very, very well. Um, and everybody's pretty trusting of him. Uh, however, he brought this huge box back to the island that you get a scene where he kind of knocks on it and something inside knocks back. And uh, since coming back to the island, some weird stuff starts happening. Um, there's this huge mm-hmm. storm. And after the storm, uh, a bunch of cats' bodies kind of wash up on to the island that have like large bites out of them. And uh, um, everybody's trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. A couple people go missing and uh, the priest gets a girl to walk again. And it's this miracle situation, and everybody's like, whoa, what the fuck is happening? Um, Turns out, the priest is actually their um, old priest. What's the... It's bothered me. What's the word? Uh, John... uh, Uh, Oh, Monsignor. Monsignor Monsignor John Pruitt. Yes. Um, Does anybody know what a Monsignor actually is? Is it like one step below a bishop or something? I don't actually know. I'll look it up. Yeah, look it up for us. So... Father Paul Hill is actually Monsignor Pruitt, their old priest. But while he was away in Jerusalem, um, he basically had dementia or Alzheimer's, and they sent him on this trip anyway. Um, And while on the trip, he got scared and got lost in the wilderness sort of situation. And there was this big kind of dust storm in the area that uncovered this old ruin. He went into the ruin for shelter, and while he was in there, he came across um, what we know as a vampire, but what he um, recontextualizes as an angel. Um, The angel bites him and feeds off of him and then gives him blood, uh, which de-ages him and makes him healthy. And kind of through this, he's like, oh, an angel of the Lord, like, I need to bring this back home. Um, to save the people of my island. Um, And so he kind of brought it back home, and now this vampire is going around um, feeding off of animals and people. During this time, Riley starts meeting with Father Paul Hill for, like, AA meetings, because it's part of his um, parole. And uh, he's talking to him about, like, alcoholism and all of that. And one night... For because someone on the island is missing that they're both close to, um, he comes across um, Father Paul Hill meeting with the vampire and is like, what the fuck? And then the vampire attacks him and turns Riley into a vampire. Um, Riley's not cool with this, though, and he eventually unalives himself while uh, proves, proving kind of what's going on to his friend uh, Aaron Green, while they're on a bit boat um, off on the water, uh, he basically takes her out there at night uh, close to sunrise, and then the sun rises and he burns to a crisp. Um, so now she knows what's going on. She goes back to the island and starts trying to rally a few people to save the island. However, some people have found out the truth of um, the Monsignor and what's actually happening, and that there's this angel, and they've kind of fully bought in and are, like, converting the whole island. They're basically feeding the island the vampire's blood as part of the Eucharist, Um, and that's how these miracles are happening. And they're slowly, like, turning everybody into vampires. Then Easter Sunday, they have this big service where uh, they give everybody poisoned Kool-Aid Um, so that they'll die and then they'll resurrect as vampires. Um, And they consider that kind of being the chosen of God's army and that they're going to go out and kind of save the world. Um, But then um, things happen. They burn down all of the buildings in the town except for the church so that they can pick and choose who they want to be part of God's army. And everybody else will die out in the sunlight. Um, And then somebody kind of 
realizes that this is wrong and burns down the church as well, kind of dooming them all. And mm-hmm. they all die on the island except for like two people who get away, um, who were like innocent of all of this, basically. Um, and the show ends. Um, as I said, that is a very, 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 very broad overview of what's yeah. happening. Very um, I now. skip over a lot of plot lines. Um, but yes, um, it's an incredible show. And let's talk about it. Let's. Um, I think, so just starting off um, from mm-hmm. my perspective, um, oh, me. Monsignor. Just oh, real yeah. quick. That yes, is, uh... please. It is an honorific. It has it's a form of address, but not like a special appointed position. Oh, okay. So you do have special outfit that goes with it, but you don't have the extra responsibilities of a bishop or cardinal. Oh, got okay. it. Got it. Gotcha. Got it. Got so it. So basically, you've been a priest for a fucking long time. Have a fancy name for it. Kind of. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. Catholicism. Gotta love it. So you, do not um... have to. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't even don't live with it. Can't burn it. <laughs> Me and partner of the podcast Heather um, watched this uh, the the day it came out. We basically binged it. Um, a good thing to do. A great thing to do. And um, my mistake. We were very much enjoying it. And then the end of episode three is when it's revealed uh, who Father Paul Hill actually is, and kind of like the vampire plot line and all of that. And that's when I kind of i messaged a lot of people but i kind of posted in like our discord server like hey guys you need to watch this uh because i really i as someone who's gotten into horror pretty recently um but has been aware of it for a while i haven't known any like really good serious takes on vampire lore that have come out like in quite a while Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. And seeing this and seeing how it was handled and seeing the way it was being tied up in religion, I was just super fucking fascinated. Uh And as people who are like more aware of horror as in like a larger context, I was like, I really, really, really want to hear Noah, Nina and Jeff's takes on this show. Um, Even though I hadn't finished it yet, I was just like, I love where this is going. I love kind of the direction this is taking. Um, this is incredible. And I love the rest of the show. And that's why, like, as you guys were watching, I kept asking, like, where are you at? I was like, please tell me when you finish episode three. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was like, I so wanted to like hear what you guys were thinking or how you were feeling about the show. Um, but that's kind of like me coming into the show. That's where I realized, like, oh, I love what this is. Um, and that's when I started bugging you guys, but I really want to kind of just hear, hear, talk, talk about the show with me. Like, what do you guys think? How'd you guys, so for me, love it. uh, as soon as you started recommending it, I looked at it a little bit and I was like, oh, okay. So a horror series that's got like blatant religious overtones, huh? I've been out of church for almost a year now. I think I'm ready for that. And then <laughs> and you were wrong. Literally, like the next day, Becca was like, hey, so I saw there's this new show on Netflix. It's called Midnight Mass. It looks really good. Would you want to watch it? And I was like, I was already planning to. Perfect. So yeah. we watched the whole thing in the span of a week. And boy, the vampire reveal. I just freaked at that. Holy yeah, shit. It's Wasn't it so neat? good? It's so fun. It's so fun. Right? It doesn't take, it simultaneously takes itself, like, it just takes itself the exact right amount of seriously. Yeah. I Mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Like, the the amount of... I mean, from our initial hint of, oh, there's a giant albatross flying around. Yeah, you you kind of get the idea, like, (laughs) things are going kind of weird. And I feel like the, just and from, like, a storytelling perspective, I feel like the way that things are revealed the like the pace that things are revealed is almost perfect because everything that gets revealed got revealed like right after either me or becca guessed it Mm -hmm. like 
at at one point i was like holy shit he's been sneaking vampire blood into the sacrament and feeding it to everybody at mass every day and then like two minutes later it's revealed that that's exactly what's been happening yeah so i was like oh all right right. (laughs) so like like the way that everything is shown and hinted at and stuff is just so good like you're actually able to follow it at like the perfect pace it's so good Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nina figured out that paul was actually pruitt i think on episode like beginning of episode two she's just like "Mm -hmm." and And i'm like i don't think i was a little excessive don't you think (laughs) i don't think i wasn't supposed that's the other thing about this um and a lot of i think uh all of Mike Flanagan's shows. I don't think you're not supposed to figure it out before it happens. Yeah. I don't, I think you are supposed to hope that you're right, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. and think this would be such a cool review, I, reveal. I hope that they do it. And then they do. And yeah. it's even cooler than you thought it was going to be like the, the whole sequence of Paul in the confessional booth talking about yes. what he went through. Yes. Is yeah. and every every time that they decide to go back to that scene right mm-hmm. after something really gut punching has happened yeah. in real time. I loved that Pruitt is my favorite character, Ooh. Paul John Pruitt man. Mm-hmm. He's so interesting. So interesting. Um so so good i don't know i just i love him but not in the way of like i both feel sympathetic towards him with what's revealed at the end which recontextualize everything he does in a really good way i could not view the show and feel the same way i did about him in my first viewing ever again because when i watched it the first time i was like this man is a conniving bastard and then at the end of the of the of the um of the show i'm like wait a minute and a lot of the things he did that were creepy or that seemed misguided suddenly you see that he like a lot of people in religion did have intentions that he fully believed were pure and other people took advantage of his pure intentions and that's what led to the downfall of this of this community was people feeding off each other's good intentions for their own gain and that was like, huh, oh, I yeah. don't know. I love him as a character and I love I love this whole show. Um, but Jeff, please continue. I'll, I'll tell my bit in a second. Well, yeah, I just I, I feel like if this if if the storytelling here is consistent with other Mike Flanagan works, it seems to me like he's the guy he's a guy who actually understands the way a whodunit is supposed to work. You know, like it's not supposed to shock you at the end. You're supposed to be able to follow Mm -hmm. along and figure it out. And the reveal at the end should make you feel smart because you figured it out, not stupid because you didn't. You know, it's it's not what J.J. Abrams is always making it be, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's that's all I was getting to there. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I also really enjoyed as this show went on, like my immediate thought was I don't trust Paul at all. There's not a single bit of me that trusts Paul. And then as as the uh, the house of cards topples like a stack of dominoes or whatever the quote is, um, you know, <laughs> I start to care more and more about Paul. Yeah. And I realize, oh, no, they're setting the worst character I've ever seen in my life up <laughs> as the main villain. I don't want this at all. <laughs> I f- cannot overstate the amount of burning hate in my heart for beverly yeah i don't know that i'll be able to watch anything with the actress in it again for a while right because i hated that so so much flames she's on the sides of my face oh my gosh (laughs) she she's gonna be (laughs) in uh mike flanagan's new show that we were talking about uh, okay i mean i'll still so, watch it but i won't trust yeah. her well, yeah but it'll be hard for me to trust her <laughs> she did an incredible job she with did that character. so she good did so holy good. shit her casual bigotry where she's just like oh i'm not saying i am a bigot i'm just very bigoted thing yeah. but you understand where i'm coming from raids, the way that she just starts yes. going and yes berates mm-hmm. yes. people into submission yes. by just not shutting up mm-hmm. is very true to and i was this is okay so beverly I'm going to get into it now. Beverly is 
I have so much to talk about with this character, too, so I'm really glad we're getting I think we all do. She hit very close to home for everyone. Yeah. (laughs) So um, this requires me to get a little bit into my background. Um, I am a very, you can't really tell this, I don't think, by how I talk. Uh, If you've met me, you will know this. I am a, like, fairly androgynous presenting person i don't go super feminine in my, in my clothing i cut all of my hair off the moment i felt like i wouldn't have it wouldn't be the end of my life if i did um socially um and i have always been like I, for a while i was like one of those not like other girls and i like really liked hanging out with the boys and all that um and what i didn't understand as a kid was that that made that like innocent self-expression was seen as dangerous and sinful for some reason it's by the adults by the adults that i was around um specifically at one church and at this church the pastor's wife um the the youth group happened to be me my brother and the pastor's two children and then like one guy that maybe showed up every now and again um and the pastor's wife, the amount of, I don't know, I, I wonder if it, it kind of plays into the conversation that that Paul and Riley have about jealousy and being jealous that someone else can get away with something with no guilt. That's, what a good moment. That Ooh. is almost Ooh. how I feel now that she, it seemed like she felt about me. There was something that she didn't like about me and all that I could understand was that it wasn't I wasn't like her. And that is Beverly. And that the conversation she has with people who are just not like her, and that is somehow a sin, um, were really close to home. I think the only thing that I wish he had, and I understand why he didn't, time constraints and needing a villain, et cetera, et cetera. I wish he, and maybe also just the fact that this is, that's not his story to tell. I wish that he had explored what creates Beverly's Mm. because it, it's not, she's not that way just because she's an evil person or just because she wants to be better than everyone. She is that way for the same reason that I do not go to church anymore. She is that way because of the pressures put on her by the Christian church to be a perfect woman. And she has worked so hard and gone to so many lengths to be at the point she is at the right hand of this like cult leader that anyone who doesn't try as hard as she is and anyone who doesn't conform to that, um, the standards that have been set for her that she felt forced to conform to, that's why she doesn't want people to get the same thing she has because she had to go through so much shit and seeing other people offered the mercy that she feels she wasn't afforded burns. And I feel like that wasn't really explored with her. I feel Mm. like there were some hints of it with how she treats some of the other island members in the final scenes where she won't let some of them into the church, despite Mm. the fact that someone else found them worthy. Um, She's starting to apply her own levels of judgment. Um, Yeah, that's that's something that like I I did feel some level of mostly hatred. Oh, the conversation between her and Annie. Where mm-hmm. Annie's just like, why do you hate that God loves everyone as much as he loves you? Yeah. Yeah. And they never get they never give you an answer to that question. Mm-hmm. I um, love in the that, show, though, but that is where that is was, Annie was such a like, strong moment. Yeah, go. Annie was Annie, like, talk. I think you need to hear this, and it's something that somebody should have told you a long time ago, but you are not a good person. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. yeah. That, then, like, that was such a good moment. Such a good scene. So a delicious. Really good moment. Delicious. Yeah. Such I, a good scene. I, I wish I could say that to so many people in my yeah. life. Right. Uh, well, because every, every goddamn church on the planet has a Beverly Keene. Yes. I have never been to a mm-hmm. church that didn't have one. Yeah. They, I wanted, there is I told always Noah at least that. one of them. I told Noah I wanted to make this Facebook post um about how the church made me feel growing up in it as someone who like and i all of us here every every one of these hosts i know have had the uh, some level of the same like treatment by the church 
Um, obviously for different reasons and on different levels, oh, but absolutely. not one of us here hasn't experienced that. Like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, when you're made an outcast, it's a specific word, but it doesn't matter. Ostracization. Um, ostracization. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I can't believe that was yeah. the right um, word. <laughs> thank you. That is so proud. We're so in sync. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that like, I have wanted to tell, I have wanted to do what Annie did to every person in my life who made me feel that way Yeah. for so long. I, I wish that I didn't also, I think the only thing that made that moment not hit for me was that in the early episodes, Annie was very close to being a Bev Keen as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. In her so particular I, way. In her, in her own kind of, and the way that she treated Aaron, I wish yeah. My only thing is that because I'm pr- probably just because I project onto Aaron more, I wish Aaron had been the one to be able to say it to Bev. I I understand why Annie did, and I'm 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 glad that someone said it to her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it does I, feel I like she kind of stole it, it from Aaron, though, in a way. It could a not bit. come from Aaron because Bev doesn't respect Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. She would way. never listen. That's like true. she she did respect Annie, and that's why Annie saying it actually kind of means more yeah it did it did exactly what it needed to in the moment was just which was just made her think long enough that um that she didn't (laughs) that they were able to stall for other characters to escape although i wonder if maybe that moment was part of the reason that bev got so much more nasty in the later stages oh, after for that. for sure. Because yeah. that's what they do when right? you tell... That's why you can't tell them these things. Yeah. Is because... Because they won't yeah. listen. They will they'll just, get worse. They'll contextualize you as the bad guy every time. That is why it's impossible to talk to people in that situation is because they have been given exactly the way that Bev gives Paul his justifications for killing people. They have been given mm. the perfect framework to always be the good guy, no uh-huh. matter how true what they are being told. There's is. a Bible verse yeah. to quote for absolutely everything, no matter what you're yeah, trying to justify, you can put it there. And that's why, like, I love this show showing that through kind of the vampire plot. Yes. Is like religious people can contextualize literally fucking anything using the mm-hmm. Bible. Yeah. Um, but. Also, um, I wanted to say that I really love the fact that Annie did at the beginning seem very much kind of like a Bev and very Bev sympathetic um, because they are two very similar characters. But showing that distinction and that growth towards the end of Annie recognizing that what was happening was wrong and not okay, and Bev kind of like sticking with it, just kind Mm -hmm. of like showing that like those two people can exist very closely in the church. Um, I just thought that was yeah. really cool. Yeah, sort of like the but, difference is one having actual good intentions and yeah. the other one not really. Yeah. Which I think actually ties into something that made me incredibly happy about this was that this show was not afraid to point out that there can be good people at church. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I feel like a yeah. lot of shows that criticize religion end up landing on the and that's why religion is terrible. Yeah, the, real, the whole like, thing Reddit is just church bad, church bad, church yeah. bad, church bad. Oh, mm-hmm. by the way, church bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I, was, was, I was incredibly pleased that they ended up landing on. Actually, the problem is there's a lot of bad people. The problem is the system itself. And the itself. system is bad. But there's also good people in a system they don't know yeah. is bad. They well, are I think, victims yeah. as much as they are perpetuating the system, which is what's so why it's so difficult to talk to anyone yeah. who's in that situation. And I think the whole mm-hmm. thing kind of gets tied up by my favorite moment in the entire series, which is in the final episode when, uh, I don't remember his name, I'm sorry, Riley's dad is talking to Ed. 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 When Ed is talking to Annie. Ed's a fucking saint. Holy shit, I, I love, love this dude. Ed. He reminds me of so many of my friends' dads. Like, mm-hmm. I cannot even explain how much he reminds me of so many old church dudes that I know. But there is this moment at the end after they've both been turned, and he says, I just don't understand it. When I saw them back at the church, I thought it must be something that you had no control over, something you couldn't resist. But now here I am, and I feel the same draw, the same hunger, the same emptiness that they do. 
and I can resist it. Whatever this thing is, mm-hmm. it doesn't change who you are. That yeah. line, holy shit. When he said that, I was I like, yeah, that's that. so that's good. it. That's the whole thing. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, obviously, of course, you know, vampirism in this is kind of allegorical to the way that the church offers salvation, sort of like in Twilight, but we're not going to talk about Twilight right now. But <laughs> like someday, <laughs> I love the way that it like it sort of puts the themes almost too much on Front Street. Right. But I think it's just the right amount to really hammer home that, like, this is actually what the story is saying. Like, it's not necessarily church or God that's the problem. It's that it does too much to enable bad people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember when talking about the show when it first came out, when I was recommending it to people um, and giving, like, a little bit of a kind of just kind of pitch for what it was. Um, somebody said it might have been in this server, it might have been in another server, but somebody was like, Oh, so it's kind of like a story showing like how religion is bad. And I was like, Yes and no. Yeah. Because I was like, it really shows that there are good people in religion as well. Um, but it does Those also people... show that there <laughs> are bad people in religion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like uh one of my things is like in stories like that having the characters who have done harm but are good people getting not getting away with it you know yeah. mm-hmm. having to still answer for what they did whether by just apologizing god damn it <laughs> um yeah. and actually like <laughs> actually learning what what they've done wrong and taking the actions to make up for it the way that Annie and Ed both do um in sacrificing themselves the way that um oh my god oh my god paul uh the 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 conversation between paul doesn't get enough of it uh he does he does kind of it feels hollow when paul when paul kind of goes back on everything that he's been doing uh it feels almost hollow the way that he chastises bev um because he had the power to stop it at any point and now that the one person that he cared about that drove him to do all of this got hurt, only now is he willing to like go back on it. Um, it, but still, you know, well, it, it means that I, he's not as good of a person. This, as, like, I ever. felt like the reason he went back on topic. it. I felt like the reason he went back on it was more because Bev was turning people away, and he felt that was wrong. No, no, because he when he was. Uh, shot in the head on the ground and healing yeah and bev just decided well i'm in I charge know he now. didn't want this to happen but i know what's best and she like while he is incapacitated lays waste to the entire place yeah so yeah allow me to go on a long tangent about Bev. go please. off please do oh i can't wait i love bev is a piece of shit and i hate her absolutely okay. i love how this show shows bev yes mm-hmm. um so the town drunk Joe Colley uh, is I very anti Bev. Um, and while Joe is talking to Riley after an AA meeting, he describes Bev as very like kind of sneaky and uh, like she never says like what she's actually doing. Mm-hmm. And in mm-hmm. the show, the show never really directly shows what Bev is doing. Yeah. That's um, point. Yeah. Like, like you when see, she poisons his dog. And they yeah, never confirm that it was Yeah, her. we never really get closure well, on that. So you get a small cut where somebody puts a hot dog in front of the dog. And you can connect the dots that it's her because of the dress. Um, mm-hmm. But like that's the one thing you see where you see she's doing something behind the scenes. Other than that, the show doesn't really show you what she's doing. Um, mm-hmm. So you see her kill the dog. Uh, or you can infer that it's her. Um, then you can also infer that she poisons uh, Father Paul. Uh, she poisons his food or his drink or something. Yeah. Because you see her take the poison out of like the supply cabinet again. Mm-hmm. And then like later on that episode, he dies and then he resurrects. And it shows that that happens because there's a scene where she sees on the wall of like where the Monsignor lives, um, this old newspaper clipping of the Monsignor when he's young. 
and she notices that, and then the scene, like, cuts. And then you start getting kind of Paul Hill's confession on, like, what happens. And he's in the confession booth, and he's talking to God, but I hypothesize that he's actually also talking to Bev and kind of saying what happened. And so she kills him to kind of, like, escalate things further um, and to show like what's really going on um, because she knew he would come back. Do you but, think she, he knew that she was in there when he made the confessions or that she was? I think so. I think okay. she called him on like what's happening because of the newspaper clipping clipping. Yeah. And then I thought he, that the confession was supposed to have happened on his first night there before they had even met. Oh, that's a good point as well. I did kind of think that. I don't think so. Um, I can see where you get that, yeah. but I think um, for the sake of the theory, let's it's say not necessarily not true. But Bev Keen's character is all about control because in mm-hmm. church, women are not given positions of leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bev Keen, somebody who yearns for leadership, influence, and power, mm-hmm. has to get those through other means. Yeah. So when the Monsignor was old and had dementia, she could very easily control everything. And she did. Yeah. Uh, she, there was a big oil spill near the island that affected all the fisher, kind of the fisher's livelihoods. And she convinced everybody on the island to take like this buyout that the company was offering. And then was like, oh, give that to the church or give like a portion of that to, to the church because you're supposed to. And then she used that money to build a new rec center um, that it's hinted at, like, maybe not all of the funds went to that. Um, and maybe she kept some for herself or like something. Yeah, Joe Colley but makes then, reference to it being like a money laundering scheme by her or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, realized that she could not just simply come into a lot of money by herself. So she had to do something. <laughs> when Monsignor was old she could very easily lead him around and get him to do what she wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, So really, she was the one in control. But then when he came back young, she lost that power. But when she found out about what was really going on, Mm -hmm. she gained it back because she was able to recontextualize everything he was doing to him and kind of lead lead the situation the way she wanted. and then over time, she just kept taking more and more and more power until at the very end, when Paul Hill is kind of lying on the ground from the bullet wound, she just kind of takes over and is like, hey, everybody go attack. But mm-hmm. everything she does is so sneaky, and it's not directly shown that that's what she's doing or that those things are happening. Like, we don't get like a point of view um, scene from Bev. Like, all of her stuff is kind of happening in the background or isn't directly stated. And with just Joe Cawley having said that she's very sneaky, I love that. I just fucking love how the show showed that. Mm -hmm. Um, Rather than just expressly showing, like, oh, look at all the sneaky stuff Bev is doing and have her kind of, like, talk about, like, all of her plans directly Mm -hmm. um, in some, like, big monologue or something. Um, something I just I fucking love it. Yeah, it's so good. Uh, not to cut you off here, but I something I really no, love you're about that is uh, the fact that it's Joe Colley pointing it out. Somebody who doesn't mm-hmm. go to the church, so it's kind of like everyone in the church is kind of like you know they don't like her, but they don't see the depth of her evil, so to speak, because yeah. they're too close. They're you know they're within the church, so they're not seeing what's really going on. But somebody with an outside perspective like Joe is seeing in from the outside and it's all so obvious to him because he's not a part of it. And that's Jesus. That's every church I've ever been to. Again, like (laughs) there is always something like that. I think that that's that's something that I really like about the whole show is how it shows that people within the church miss a lot about the people that they that they think they know because they go to church with them. Yeah. Like everyone thinks they know Bev. They don't. Everyone thinks they know Aaron Green's situation. They want to judge her. They want to talk about her behind her back or treat her poorly. Mm -hmm. Riley is the one who understands her abuse, 
why she left, he's the one that gets that out of her because everyone else thinks that they know the whole story. And yeah, he's the one who bothers to listen yeah. and learn that about her. Um, same with like, you know, it's the people, it's the people on the outside who get to, who get to actually understand and help each other on the level that Christians are taught to like Dr. Dr. Sarah, uh, Gunning talking to, um, Sheriff Hassan about wanting his help and him explaining why he can't, but still, yeah, still listening to her, still listening to her, and and doing what he can anyway. I they, absolutely they talk love to the each particular other. connection between those two. Sorry, yeah, right? No, yeah, just the the like the level of community that the people who have been outcast by the church actually have is the level of community that the church proclaims to have. Yes. Um, yes. Despite the, and it's despite, the church manufactures differences between their community members. Oh, absolutely. So that they have things to judge each other for. But the people on the outside of the church could not be more different. And they connect to each other in actual deep ways and, and make efforts to connect to each other. And I think that's a really cool thing that this show shows that in the end, what brings down this cult and cults are all about like community and connection. What brings down this cult is a group of people who have almost nothing in common, um, but have made an effort to reach out to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I just think that's really cool. I love it. So good. Um, I do want to talk about Riley and Aaron. Yeah. Um, okay. And how you guys didn't like that relationship. But I'm gonna yeah. make an argument for it. Yeah. Go go ahead. I, I understand it. I just personally it didn't hit for me. So I agree. It I didn't it didn't hit really for me either, but I think there's a specific reason why. Um so they both have been separated from each other for a number of years. Obviously, life has changed them both a great deal. Um, and they're kind of re meeting in those contexts on the island. Um they get to hang out together a couple of times. Um, one of the times in particular in which they're largely able to connect is after Aaron's miscarriage, um, because that's when they have those deep discussions. But I think a lot of their scenes together and a lot of their interactions are them still feeling like a little awkward around each other, not really sure how to interact with one another yeah. and that they used to be so close, but now like life has changed them both a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But then through a couple of those long conversations, they're finally able, they're finally like feeling each other out again. They're finally understanding the dynamic of their relationship again. And I think if Riley had not gone to the church, um, that night and had instead actually gone to Aaron like he said he was going to, mm -hmm. we would have seen that relationship kind of blossom a bit more yeah. and actually turn into a relationship rather than what it was in that it was just kind of like awkwardly them trying to gauge each other again. Yeah. Um, but then with everything that happened to Riley and him becoming a vampire and not being able to live with that, um, and taking her, someone he knew he cared deeply for and knew he wanted something with, um, but now it was too late to really let that happen. Um, him kind of like admitting his love for her is kind of like what, admitting to what he wanted their relationship to become again. Um, and that it hadn't been because they didn't know who each other were but him kind of expressing that she was still very important um, and that he wished he had a, more time with her, but he needed her to understand what was happening. And this was like the only way he could really do that. Um, so I don't think this is like a relationship that we've seen in kind of the other Mike Flanagan shows where we've seen really well done, kind of like thought out um like growths of relationships and seeing their kind of conclusions and like their conflicts. But this is kind of like showing the awkwardness before a relationship is like largely what we see between Riley and Aaron. Yeah. Um, That's why I liked it. Mm -hmm. 
I liked that yeah, this I show it was wasn't really good. afraid to let it be awkward because that's what that situation would be. So mm-hmm. I, yeah, I same as you, I kind of read it more as an awkward reconnection story rather than an actual romance. And yeah, I, no, I, no, that, I mean, that's why I, I didn't like it. I well. definitely <laughs> read it as that. I just didn't feel awkward when those scenes were happening. I felt bored. <laughs> I felt yeah, I felt bored. I felt it's okay. Felt You're allowed to have opinions, but they were they were such interesting characters on their own, and I think there was like I think I I like I I liked what their relationship did for the story. I liked where it was cut off. I again saying that it's a weak point in the story doesn't mean that like on its own I think it's terrible. I just think for me it was in an overall great story the weak point. Uh, mm-hmm. It was the only time that I wasn't on the edge of my seat following the story was when Aaron and Riley were talking and I was still following what was happening. I was still invested in like their relationship. I was just like, this is not to me building a facet of the story that I feel as connected with and is as important to even their individual endings, like Riley's ending to his story did play out in a way that was directly connected to Aaron, um, obviously. But I I felt like Aaron's story, though Riley's Riley was there in that conver the one conversation that they had that I clung to, which was that conversation about what, what happens after death and that moment where they finally connect and all of that, which was very, very good and one of my favorite moments in the show. Um, I felt like Aaron's story and the parts that resonated with me personally were less related to her relationship with Riley and more related to her, just her and her journey and and her emotional path with everything that she had been put through from childhood until now. The fact that as she is on her way out, she, it it's kind of like a metaphor for like, how she she left an abusive situation be- because she was going to have a child and um it's tragic how she stays in a situation that is wounding her in the end the angel notices what she's doing to its wings and and starts to leave and she pulls him back so that she is able to save a lot of people it's tragic it's upsetting it really like rounds out her story really nicely i didn't find personally any of that same depth and connection in her relationship with Riley and in there and in, in a lot of that personally. That's that's all. I didn't think it was like, oh, a terrible relationship mm-hmm. like a la yeah. spring. I just <laughs> didn't connect to it as much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think if we I think like all relationships that are kind of like what ifs, um I think if we had gotten to seeing this relationship progress and we gotten to see their stories intertangle a bit more. Um and I think it would have been really good, but obviously that was interrupted because of the events of yeah. what happens in the story. I, um, I also, just really quick, um, I yeah. also didn't like, I liked the conversations that Riley had with other people. I I honestly didn't, Riley was like on my, uh, like the lower half of, of my favorite characters list, I think. I just, I didn't, um... I didn't I didn't like him as much as I liked some of the other characters. I liked his arc overall. I thought it was very satisfying for who he was and I really enjoyed what he brought out of other characters in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Um yeah. he, he's he was very good at being the turning point for a lot of other people. Um and I really liked his arc. But he he also just like I didn't really like I didn't feel that same pull I felt with other like um, characters who even in the beginning of their relationships, I'm like, I want you to be happy and therefore I want this relationship to work out. I was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> That's valid. No, not that you. I don't want Riley to be happy, but I did not like care as much about his happiness as I did about like Aaron's or, or Paul's or um, the kids, Lisa, mm-hmm. all of that. Yeah. Riley is... It's interesting because he is depicted in the way the show is set and moves. Um, Riley is kind of painted to be like the main character. Yeah. Um, But really, he's kind of like a side character to everybody else's story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and we Honestly, just get him like... as kind of like a main point of view character like throughout like the show i borderline feel like paul is the main character absolutely he is yeah. because everyone else it it feels like paul came in as a side character and then riley as our main character interacts with paul in such a way that paul is the focal point and then when riley dies we still have paul but it definitely feels like the main character has like shifted yeah Mm -hmm. you know and it, it almost feels like the main character then is supposed to be aaron because aaron is our new protagonist but yeah i don't think that the protagonist is ever at any point the main character of our show i it's kind of fun i kind yeah. of want to watch it a second time just to see if like knowing that riley dies knowing that riley is not properly the main character of the story watching it again will i still feel like he is or will i feel mm. like the story is just equally about everyone so yeah. that's that's you know, interesting. Like, like, do we read um, him as the main character because we expect to see a main character? You know, so that's that's interesting. Having watched Mike Flanagan's other shows, because I was about to say this, a la Noah's point, um, Paul is the main character the same way that the other two shows have a main character uh, in Nell and I think Nell and Danny would be my picks for the other two main characters. I think so. um, Nell is, I guess, kind of a folk more than a character i'm not gonna spoil yeah. anything mm -hmm. <laughs> but um i feel like none of these shows have had main characters so much as they've like had a character that gets more of the narrative focus mm -hmm. in order to keep everything coherent mm. but everyone's everyone's stories are equally important um in a lot of these and having having watched those and yeah. seeing this one i guess I, I i don't know that i expected riley to be a main character i knew he was going to i'm i guess i expected him to be the like focal character but as yeah. soon as paul got there um it riley hadn't even didn't even die before i was, say, I was like two i was like, like oh, oh paul paul. <laughs> yeah, paul has all my attention <laughs> yeah <laughs> But yeah, I do no, that's, say, that's my opinion. Uh, Noah, you brought this up earlier of not trusting Paul like mm -hmm. at the very beginning and then slowly you grow to like really like him. Mm -hmm. um, and I love how the show did that of from the very beginning, you're very suspicious of Paul because he's got the like big trunk. You get that scene pretty early yeah. on. So you're like, what the fuck is happening there? But then also because he wears the wrong color like robe uh mm -hmm. on the first sunday and bev calls him out you're like so is he really a priest or like what's going yeah. on yeah and so you're just immediately suspicious of him and of his intentions but then over time with how he connects to everybody on the island like the ways in which he helps people on the island you really start to kind of like like him and root for him um even though there's still like that bit of suspicion and uncertainty uh, because you don't know what's like actually happening but i just love kind of like how that was handled and how they took this character that you're supposed to feel suspicious of like at the be very beginning um but then they make him so goddamn likable yeah <laughs> they I, I think a lot of it's the way they show his vulnerability they are not afraid to show this man getting absolutely wrecked um uh -huh. and and be and like the coughing fits and dying like fainting um this my favorite scene with him is right after he has um fed off of joe collie and he is huddling in the corner of his house and bev finds him um mm -hmm. and he is both absolutely shattered and also handling it way better than i would expect him to because <laughs> bev's like hey we need to get you out there for church and he's like yeah okay um about that and he shows her that the sun will absolutely demolish him um yeah. i don't i just the 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 amount of vulnerability that they show him in yeah. makes you really feel for him um just as you're like wow this guy's been through a lot <laughs> yeah yeah um i also would love to talk about the characterization of the vampire or the mm -hmm. angel. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, can we talk about yes, Father so Paul good. for like a couple more minutes before we move to that? Yeah, absolutely. Because I've been wanting totally to talk is. about this since the beginning <laughs> of the recording it. when we were talking about him the first time, and I've just been holding it this whole yes. time. Um, Please, Jeff, like, go off. There's just too much to talk about in this show. 
Um, there is. Really there's is. a lot. He's written so well as a uh, like preacher. Like, mm-hmm. not to say that his sermons are good or whatever, but, like, the way that he acts toward everyone that he interacts with reminds me of, uh, I'm saying this phrase again, every pastor in every church I've ever known. Like, he, the Did that way, line about, you know, Jesus hung out with uh, sinners and everyone, so I would say, uh, you being here, I'm in good company. Like, that line? Yeah, that kind of thing. Riley. Yeah, oh, Did that get you? all the scenes between him and Riley at the AA meetings. Like, the mm-hmm. first one where they're just sitting there and it's just the two of them facing each other in that giant room and he's like yeah gosh i didn't i hadn't thought about how awkward this would be with just the two of us <laughs> <laughs> like that that feels like every church event ever right like they mm-hmm. they talk about it for weeks at a time and then you show up and there's like four people and everyone's like well i hadn't thought about how awkward this was going to be if only us showed up and that's what happens every time though like it's the the way that all of that is approached and the way that uh the way that he approaches every issue that's ever brought up to him and stuff just feels so much like all of my actual church experiences like it's just it's portrayed so well Mm -hmm. well i i really love how even though we know by the end that he had good intentions Mm -hmm. I, this is how this is how I feel about like you said every pastor ever. Right. The even though their intentions are good, their sermons are so fucking manipulative. Yes. So manipulative. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Everything he says is to set up the next step in his plan. Even if he is doing it with intentions to save people, he knows that he's not telling the whole truth yeah. in his sermons. He is telling them exactly what he knows they need to hear to buy into his plan yeah. because he knows if he told the truth, like he says in his confessional booth, no one would go along with it. He cannot let them know the whole truth. He has to feed it to them bit by bit. Yeah. And he knows how to do that masterfully. So you can't even just yeah. call him a victim yeah. or you can't even just call him a victim of good intentions. He is he is manipulative. There you cannot yeah. sugarcoat it. Yeah. And I mean, really that's that's the the biggest similarity between him and Bev, right? Is they're both incredibly deeply manipulative people. It's just Bev tends to be doing it to increase her own standing and he tends to be doing it with the intent of trying to help the people that he's talking to. Yeah. Yes. I like that that's shown as well and that he was getting weak and getting sick because he gave all of the vampire blood that he had to everybody else in the town yeah. because mm-hmm. he wanted to make sure that they were being taken care of. Um, and he was potentially going to die because he wanted to make sure that the town was saved. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, it's a fucked up version of being saved, as we know, right. but it's still like interesting to see that characterization yeah all right so about the vampire so about the vampire um Mm -hmm. i love this vampire um i love that it clearly so after me and heather watched it um i was like this is the best like kind of story about a vampire and its vampire spawn that i have seen um or that i know about yeah because that's what like all of these people are. They're not necessarily vampires in their own complete right yet. Yeah, not fully. They're this creature's vampire spawn and they're dependent on it and it can communicate with them telepathically and the, all this other shit. Um and I just I think it's so fucking cool. But I love um the glimpses that we get of it in the first couple episodes like it um kind of in the woods when those kids are like sitting by the campfire and we get that quick shot of it, like standing and watching them in the field like that. Amazing. And then when we see it in the house where it lures the kid to the house, um, to feed off of him and we see like the image of the vampire, like on the ground, kind of watching him in the dark corner and then standing up into the darkness and stepping out. Fucking so good. good. Mm -hmm. But then As we see it, again, throughout the rest of the series, we see it in the rec center in the Monsignor's, like, coat and hat. And I love that that touch. It looks so so fucking cool. And then that connects you to, like, oh, so that's who you saw on the beach, like, the first night when Riley Uh saw 
Monsieur Senior Pruitt on the beach. Um, but also then, further on, seeing it in the priest's robes, so fucking good. Mm-hmm. And I just love, like, the vampire does not have a line throughout the entirety of the show. I was spending the entire um, show waiting for it to finally say something about, like, what's going on and why it's here. And it just doesn't. Yeah. But no. It's clearly it, fucking loving this shit. Oh, yeah. yes. The way you it can walks see... down the aisle. Uh-huh. And yeah, just you like, can... yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm yeah. hot shit. Here are my fucking wings. <laughs> you can see through all of its actions and everything that it's doing. It clearly has a personality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it yeah. has a goal, and it's so interesting, but it doesn't have a line throughout the entirety of the show. Yeah. Um, you, the only lines you get from it are indirect in that you, like, Father Paul says that, like, it's telling him, like, telepathically, basically, to do certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think it's so yeah. cool. I just think it's so cool. (laughs) Okay, so this actually lets me talk about the stupidest thing about me in this show. Oh, I was going to talk about a serious thing in relation to that. All right. Oh, do you want to go? I can't. It'll be really. It's it's really. I love stupid. No, you go ahead. You were talking first. Production note to talk about after Nina and before Jeff gets. Okay, I'll get. I'll be really fast. So I've been watching the What We Do in the Shadows TV series, um, and Mm -hmm. one of the characters that they bring up is the first vampire ever. And with bringing up this character, the sire, they also bring up that if he dies, a vampire myth is that if he dies, every vampire ever will also die. Um, And what I, that kind of made me think is that it's kind of, you think left open-ended whether or not he's going to be able to fly with his clipped wings the 30 miles to land. But Lisa loses feeling in her legs. Yeah. And I think that's when the angel dies. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's because how I read that. That would as well. cut her power. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it was really so. wild to me that these two shows at the same time were like, and if the vampire that makes you die, you lose all your vampire powers. I'm like, yeah. oh shit. Um, so I just thought it was fun. That is neat. Um, yeah. my my thing I'd like to point out is just the really cool um production details as it went on. Because in episode like halfway through episode two or whatever, I started thinking, wow, I thought everyone's hair was darker than this. Uh-huh. And as it goes on a little bit longer, I, I just continued to think, wow, their hair is getting darker, right? Like, yeah, they were like slate gray when they came in, weren't they? And then, you know, it, it becomes more and more like blatant, you know, with um, yeah. Annie taking her glasses off and like, Ed can lift boxes again. Yeah. You know, like it, it's more and more blatant as it goes, but I really loved how at first I'm watching this and I'm like, I thought Ed's hair was lighter than this. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. The subtle okay. touches are so cool. They and then, so cool. oh my gosh. And then watching Mildred um, eventually like just become much, much younger. Yeah. Where she started out being like unrecognizable at all as a young person. And then gradually the wrinkles just kept going away. And yeah. I really love like little details like that where like because the show started and I'm like, holy shit, these people are so fucking old. Yeah. And that was my first impression of everybody. I'm like, they all look so See, the old. first couple of scenes with Mildred, <laughs> I was kind of like, wow, they put extra old person makeup on her, huh? That's kind of odd. It's kind of weird to do that with an already old actress <laughs> because that's what I thought yeah. was going on. <laughs> and then she starts like de-aging as it goes on and I was like, oh, I see, I'm an idiot. It was all old person makeup. <laughs> yeah. Noah and I had that same conversation about Dementia Pruitt. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Because he's like, no, that's not the same actor. It, it was, was just the like, same actor. It can't actor. possibly be. <laughs> I thought it was really cool in I- that like like you said, almost everybody had old person makeup. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, gosh, the old woman, you just said Mildred. her name. Mildred. Mildred. Mildred, like, is the only one where, like, almost every scene that you see her, she is, like, noticeably younger yeah. by, like, a large margin. Mm-hmm. But everybody else on the island, it's incredibly gradual and subtle, yeah. and you don't really notice it. And I just think it's so fucking cool. It's so good. Like, it would have been so easy for them to make it less gradual than that. Mm -hmm. And they chose to make it really slow and subtle, and I love that. Yeah, it was great. But Jeff, what were you going to say about Vampire Daddy? About Vampire Daddy. 
Wow. I, <laughs> you must. You got to stop saying things like this because sometimes I just repeat the things that other people say and I don't think about it until it's out of my mouth. <laughs> so about Vampire Daddy, though, because that's sticking now. Uh, yeah. I thought the fact that he, you know, after I had gotten all the way to the end of the show and I was like processing it, I was like, you know, the fact that he doesn't talk at any point. And we only ever hear any of his, you know, intentions or whatever through uh, Pruitt is really perfect for the larger religious allegory of the story, because the vampire is kind of representing God in this situation. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we would never hear anything directly from him. And every time somebody does something and they say it's because it's what he's saying, because it's what he wants, it makes you think, oh, OK, so is is Pruitt actually hearing from this thing? Because we've got no evidence of it talking ever or yeah. really communicating in any kind of a clear way. So it makes you think, is is Pruitt actually communicating with this thing, actually hearing from it? Or is he just projecting his own desires onto it and reading that as its communication to him? Copy-paste onto every pastor in every church that I've ever... I'm going to stop saying that phrase eventually, but, like... <laughs> Not in this episode. Yeah, like, I... God, I have... I've hung out in some relatively charismatic churches. I've hung out in some extremely conservative churches. And everywhere, you at some point end up hearing somebody say, I did this because I heard the Spirit telling me to do it or whatever. And every fucking time, I would always think, well, did, did you though? Like, <laughs> <laughs> was that just what you wanted to do maybe? Was that just what you thought was the right thing to do, perhaps? I mean, that's doing something because you think it's the right thing to do isn't a wrong thing. You don't have to lie about it. Why yeah. do you feel like I you have to hide behind God for this? Like, Me and Nina were talking about that when uh, she was visiting last weekend. And uh, I was like, yeah, being... Like, I used to do that all the time, but now being outside of the church and not really religious anymore, it's really interesting to hear people do that or see people do right. that um, for certain situations. And it's like, no, that's clearly not what's going on. <laughs> yeah. What's actually going on is that's what you want. Yeah. But you're just saying, I feel like God is calling me to do X thing. Yeah. Well, I feel like a lot of that comes back around to the point where a lot of people act like without a higher power, you can't have a moral center. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to do a good thing, obviously it has to be the it higher power be. telling you to do it so. It must be. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, and and a couple things. Firstly, like um, with Midnight Mass, I love how they do like outright contextualize that by Bev telling because Pruitt knows that killing Joe Colley was not the right thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he has other people in his life coming to him and validating what he wants to hear. Bev. He has Bev come in and Bev's the one who says it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was was what was moving you. Yeah. Um so there is this level of like the fact again it, 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 I Jeff I I know that you feel like you're repeating yourself. I feel you're like stealing I'm stealing my catchphrase. Myself. It's <laughs> It's that it's that cis it's again it's systemic it's these rules that have put, been put in place so you cannot be reproached you want something you know that all you have to do for other people to tell you that you're doing the right thing is that you just have to say that God told you yeah to. you just got to quote a Bible verse while you're talking about it nobody will question a thing and no one will want to question you yeah you know and it will hurt to question you you like. You tell people this is what God's telling me, and if they say that's not well, you're doubting God. What, that's that's why still, are you doubting or, God? <laughs> yeah, or you even if you don't believe it, and this is this is gonna out myself a little bit here. But, you have to lie. You have to say, well, I feel like God's telling me this other thing. <laughs> it's inter Maybe God's telling me a different facet of the situation. Yeah, yeah. There's you know. there's. That's the only way to have any kind of leverage. But even even then, you can't even get it because you're the second person to say it. Or which, exactly. What are you just copying what Versus they're doing? Versus like everyone like, else is agreeing. And and at that point, they've probably had a bunch of other people who have like heard them say, God told me this. Yeah. And they don't, they don't want to approach that. So they have said, yeah, God told you this. And so by the time someone is finally brave enough to say, hey, uh, that actually seems like a bad idea. They're like, how dare you not only... Uh, like 
negate what God told me, but what God told all these other people that told me that that's what God told me. You know, it's it's yeah. it's a it, again, it is an echo chamber in the most like almost literal sense. Yeah. So it's rough. It's really rough. Um, yeah. To... Yeah. I loved that. Go for oh, it. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go for it. I was oh, going okay. off topic. I will. No, I was going to go back. I was actually going to go back to what you were talking about with the angel and with how people you don't know whether they're they're talking about actually hearing him honestly or if they are. But in, in defense of religion. Yeah. Um. Almost. Even though we don't hear the angel say what he wants, we can very clearly see through his action and what he makes happen and what he allows people to do in his name what he wants to happen. Yeah. It, even though you don't know for sure that he told Paul to do these things, he gives Paul the tools to do those things when asked. Paul's like, oh, I'm out of the sacrament. And the angel comes in and gives him more sacrament. If he didn't want that to happen, he has the power and the ability to just not give Paul any more blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, even though like certain people are definitely saying they're hearing things, that they are not hearing from him. R.E. Bev saying that killing people is okay. Yeah. Um, other people are definitely getting the right message from the angel's actions as well as whatever words they may be hearing. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. that was just a thought. Well, about and what to, said. to anyway. get back to get more into reading the angel's actions and figuring out his desires from that, there are so many scenes where uh where Pruitt, Father Paul, whatever, is stuck in his house alone and he is terrified because he doesn't know what's happening to his body and he's like praying over and over and over for the angel to come back and like clarify things for him and it has the telepathic link and for days weeks at a time it does nothing to update him on anything it does nothing to comfort him to tell him what's going on so he won't be so worried like it doesn't care yeah i felt it's, like that was... it is a wild yeah no definitely um, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to get back to like, Do it. I think I, the angel having a personality, like I, you're right. He doesn't care. He has he, his goal, although overall unknown to us, um, we don't know how long he was in that cave. We don't know what his, his thought was upon finding Pruitt and why he did the things he did. Like, like obviously it was to get out of the cave, mm -hmm. but once he was, once he had made Paul, once he followed Paul back, what was to stop him from feeding on everyone? He went along. What was to stop him from doing it all himself? Yeah. Why did he like follow this like ridiculously convoluted plan where they slowly feed everyone the sacrament? Like, like the fact that he comes in wearing the robes yeah. on Easter Sunday. Whose idea was that? Was that his idea? Did he, he did right? he go yeah. along with Paul being like, here, take these robes? Like he clearly has a taste for theatrics, and I kind <laughs> of fucking love that. Like to me, it yeah. really felt like um like Paul misread the situation and started worshiping him more or less. And the vampire was kind of just like, huh, cool. All right. I can be worshiped. I'll take this. Yeah. Let's do like, this. Yeah. I this feel like that's awesome, what was. Actually. This slaps. Yeah. I, I feel like that's kind of how that went down. Yeah. Me too. That it, it's so, it's so fun to watch um, whenever he's on screen and it's just like doing its thing. Oh my God. Yeah. It's almost, again, it takes itself exactly as seriously as it needs to. I think it mm -hmm. fully knows that putting this character in these robes and making him come to the front of the church like that said something about the character. I, I do not think it was trying to act like it was a serious thing that this character was doing that. I think we were yeah. supposed to like know, oh my God, this this guy is living right now. They're having the time of their yeah. lives. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, yeah, I love that. I love that because it's not a comedy in the way that what we do in The Shadows is, but it also plays on our expectations of vampire lore. Yeah in a way that's that is very what we do in the shadows like it's very satirical of what we know of vampires um and it chooses to observe certain rules and and not others um in a way that both makes it scientifically viable as a blood disease which like obviously is a stretch but it's a fun like it's a fun yeah. uh canonization and also um 
and also makes it possible for it to be a religious show. Because if 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 religious symbols affected this creature in any way, <laughs> right. we would not have a show. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I still I don't know if garlic like... hurts it at all. They didn't really go. They didn't into approach. That. They didn't it talk does about fly that over yeah. some water. So, and I believe it enters homes without permission. <laughs> Everyone at the end knocks on the doors. They well, do. I guess they kind of break into windows they, as well. But a lot do. of them knock on the doors. A lot of them do I knock kind of on felt like it, at most that was just a nod to that beat a bit of lore yeah. without being like an explicit admission. Yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, a big plot hole. Okay. Oh, in the show, that? we love plot holes. Do we? we How love did the vampire holes? speak English or understand English? Uh, it communicated exclusively through a telepathic link, if at all. So uh, the languages are Maybe kind of. Maybe it was more just a feeling. Languages are kind of immaterial when you have a telepathic link, right? Yeah. Um. No. Well, in Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition. <laughs> oh shit! Um, <laughs> oh no. shit! Here she goes. I'm just fucking. My lack of Dungeons and Dragons but... experience is finally catching up to me. <laughs> I think. <laughs> We could talk about this show all we day. I yeah, guess. we are at danger of doing um, so right now. We are. Yeah, we've been talking about it for quite a while at this point. Longer than this episode is supposed things, to be. But and there's so I do much more. Say, there's so much more still. There's so much more. Please, there's please, so much more. I do want to give this. a shout out. Everyone listening to this, please, if you've got thoughts on this show, talk to us about it in the Discord. We will talk please. forever about this we show. We will set up a special yeah. channel just to talk about midnight mass I don't, so that if you don't want to you won't be spoiled well, that makes sense yeah that's a smart move that makes yeah. sense yeah. yeah absolutely anyway emma emma's been wanting yeah, to wrap emma, things up sorry <laughs> I, wrap up, up, and then... <laughs> I think there's a lot else you can say about this movie um we have kind of talked or brought up slightly um the sheriff's character and the representation for islam um which I don't think any of us know a lot about Islam, so we can't speak yeah. to that. But I do want to call out that that uh, from the stuff I've seen online about um, kind of that representation, it seems like it's done really, really effectively and really well. And people mm -hmm. are very happy That's with how it. That's it felt to me, sir. So I do just want to, yeah, I do just want to call out that that is incredible yeah. as well and both. Um, actors who played the Muslim characters in the show did a phenomenal yeah. job. But um, yeah, that is going to be our bonus episode yeah. uh, where we talk about Midnight Mass. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at Casual Horror Pod. There is a link to our Discord there as well if you want to join and talk to us about the show. Um, personally, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch at Emma Panada. Uh, on Twitch, I stream TTRPG games, so if you ever want to see us playing D&D &D or other things, uh, feel free to give me a follow. But where can we find the rest of you? You can find me as Bubba the Bad, B-U-B-B-A-D-A-B-A-D, -A -A -D, on uh, Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram. Please uh, do talk to us about these shows. I'm yes. very, very yeah. interested in hearing more opinions. Um, I, Absolutely. I am, you can find me at Nina Wolverina or How Such Rises on Twitter. Um, you can find also find me, and I'm going to put this out there for this episode specifically, through our Discord server, I'm in there, and if you want to DM me to talk about this show... Um, special one-time offer. Special one-time offer for things that might be a little... a little Things that I don't necessarily talk about on, on, on air, things I don't talk about on my Twitter because it's very... I try to keep my branding very succinct. That's not to say I wouldn't be willing to talk about like religion, religious trauma, religion and gender, religion and being a woman, religion and sexuality. I love talking about that. I believe um, there's no way for any of us who have gone through this to like fully process what we've been through in a way that it will heal us. But I think the closest we can come is talking to each other. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, DM me if, if you want to talk about it at any point. Um, I love hearing other perspectives. That's all I got to say. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can find me, Jeff, on Twitter at Bubba Wubba Dab. You can find me on uh, Instagram and TikTok at The Hammer of Jeff. Um, more or less the same as all of what Nina said. Like, I'm very ready to talk about uh, like religious trauma and issues and stuff of that nature at this point. Like, I, 
I think I kind of needed to be quiet about it for a little while, but I, I think I'm ready to talk about it with anybody who will talk to me about it at this point. So please, please talk to us about Midnight Mass and how it relates to us. And also, like, for, for as many things as we talked about here, like, we brought up there's a lot of points that we didn't mention, but also, like, even the things that we've talked about, we haven't covered them entirely. There's more to talk about. Yeah, with like, absolutely. Like, just, I, I feel like we could talk for another hour just about Bev's relationship with Pruitt. Not even yeah, about either of those characters individually, but, like, jointly, the way that they yeah. work together is so interesting. Ooh, yeah. Oh. But we do not have time yeah, for no, that definitely. right now. This is the we end of the episode. <laughs> Find the podcast on Twitter at Casual Horror Pod. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you all so much for hanging out with us and listening to us talk about the show. Um, if you haven't watched it and for some reason you listen to this entire thing, go watch it now. Um, <laughs> but hopefully you've watched it. But um, as always, we hope you have a great day and week and all that. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>